This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. It's good to be back after a little time off, so let's get right into the news. And wow, the fighting over Elon Musk's massive pay package is really turning into a soap opera. A group of shareholders, led by a guy named Richard Tornetta, sued Tesla to block the pay package from going through. Tornetta, who only owns nine shares of Tesla, won that fight, and now he wants the company to reimburse his lawyers to the tune of $7 billion in legal fees. That would be an all-time record for legal fees in U.S. courtrooms. So another group of shareholders is asking a judge to cut those outlandish fees to a fraction of that. Tornetta's lawyers argue they deserve the $7 billion payout because when they blocked Musk from getting the $56 billion in stock, there were 266 million Tesla shares that were reserved for stock options. And since those shares, which are worth $67 billion today, were essentially returned to the company, it was a great benefit to Tesla. And so, they deserve that record payout. But Tesla argues they should only get $13.7 million. And now we'll have to see how the judge rules on this. Meanwhile, Tesla shareholders have shrugged off the legal issues. Its stock is up 38% over the last eight weeks and it's trading at around $248 a share, which is where it started the year at before taking a long downward slide that bottomed out in late April. The EU's new tariffs on EVs made in China are already crimping Chinese exports. According to the China Passenger Car Association, prior to the EU's investigation into Chinese-made EVs several months ago, China's EV export growth was at least 30 to 40 percent for the year. But after the EU threatened tariffs, EV export growth dropped to 10 percent. Even so, China's overall car exports were up 28 percent in June. Speaking of those tariffs, BMW wants the EU to lower them on electric minis made in China. They're currently being hit with the highest 37.6% tariff, but BMW wants that drop to 20.8%. Production of the electric minis only started a few months ago, and the models weren't included in the EU's investigation into Chinese-made vehicles, so they were automatically slapped with the highest tariff. The EU is allowing automakers to petition for lower tariffs for new EVs, but a decision won't be made until the fall. Looks like that cyber attack on CDK, the company that handles most dealer management systems in the U.S., really hurt new vehicle sales in the region last month. Car dealers had a hard time processing purchases, and as a result, sales fell 4% to 1.3 million units. Worse, the SAR, or Seasonally Adjusted Annual Rate, came in at only 15.2 million vehicles, down from the 15.8 million that analysts expected, and that was down from the 16.1 million SAR that they were forecasting at the beginning of the year. General Motors saw its sales increase only 0.6% in the second quarter, Ford was only up 0.8%, and Stellantis had a disastrous quarter, with sales plunging 21%, led by big drops at Ram and Jeep, which are the company's strongest brands. However, Toyota bucked the trend, posting a strong 9% growth in sales. Interestingly, the strongest segments in the market right now are EVs and hybrids. GM's EV sales shot up 40% compared to the second quarter of last year, with the Cadillac Lyric and Chevrolet Blazer EVs posting good sales. Ford's EVs were up more than 61%, and hybrids were up 55%. Toyota's electrified vehicles, which are mostly hybrids, were up 63%. And speaking of troubles at Stellantis, it just lost another top executive. Mamatha Charmathy, who was the head of software, is the fifth senior executive to leave the company this year. Cristiani Campos was hired to replace Carmathy. On her LinkedIn page, K. 
Campos is listed as the chief financial officer at Mobile Drive in Silicon Auto in the Netherlands. She previously worked at Stellantis in Brazil in business development. There's nothing wrong with heavy metal. Hey, lighten up. But with world-class composite material, Tejin Automotive Technologies makes vehicles lighter, safer, and more eco-friendly. While Tesla is the first automaker to take the plunge into a mostly 48-volt electronic architecture, engineers have wanted to make the switch from 12 volts for decades. The reason for not doing it was always said to be cost. The cost to convert all the motors, switches, actuators, and everything else in a car to 48 volts. But even some of the traditional suppliers in this industry were willing to take the plunge with Tesla. Not long ago, we were back at vehicle benchmarking specialist Carisoft to follow along with its teardown of the Cybertruck, this time diving into its 48-volt system. And we saw several suppliers with 48-volt parts including Broza, who makes the window motor, Bosch makes the blower motor, and Vallejo makes the wiper motor. Elon Musk says Tesla will give the blueprint for its 48-volt system to any automaker that wants to use it, so more are likely to follow. And it looks like these suppliers are going after common parts that a lot of automakers would want to convert to 48 volts. Caresoft estimates that Tesla was able to reduce the size of its wires in the 48-volt system by about 50% on average, and that it cut an additional mile of wiring by going to a zonal electronic architecture. And here's another reason automakers might want to go to 48 volt. An EV requires three to five times more copper than ICE vehicles, and the grid also needs a lot of copper, and a new study says the current supply of copper just isn't enough to meet future demand. The study was conducted by professors from the University of Michigan and Cornell, sponsored by the International Energy Forum. And they say as many as six new copper mines need to open every year over the next several decades, and that 40% of production from new mines would be needed for EV-related upgrades to the electric grid, mainly for developing nations. The researchers suggest it might be more feasible to focus on hybrids instead. Ampere, which is the EV division of Renault, says it will be the first to premiere cell-to-pack technology that uses pouch battery cells. Battery cells are typically arranged in a module, and then multiple modules are combined together inside the pack. But cell-to-pack eliminates the modules, which clears up space to put more cells in the pack. Most automakers use cylindrical or prismatic batteries in their cell to packs because the cells can also provide some structure to the pack. But Renault doesn't say exactly what allowed it to use pouch cells. Along with an effort to incorporate LFP batteries from LG and CATL, Renault says it will reduce the cost of the batteries in its vehicles around 20% by the start of 2026. And speaking of Renault, but this time switching over to the ICE side of the business, oil giant Aramco is buying a 10% stake in Horse, the powertrain JV between Renault and Geely. Part of the agreement also includes a collaboration with Aramco and Valvoline on technologies, fuels, and lubricants that will help lower engine emissions. Self-driving startup Waymo just hit a milestone and has opened up its service to everyone in San Francisco. It operates 24-7 in all weather conditions, and now anyone can use it by just downloading an app. Previously, the robotaxi service was only available to a select number of users who signed up to join Waymo's waitlist. Waymo also operates an autonomous service that's open to anyone in the Metro Phoenix area. NASCAR hopes to have zero carbon footprint by 2035, and to help promote those efforts, it revealed an all-electric, all-wheel drive prototype race car with over 1,300 horsepower. The car was developed with ABB Group, who's also a major sponsor of Formula E. It's based on a modified chassis of the next-gen car that came out in 2022, and still uses the steering, suspension, brakes, and wheels from the current Cup Series car. 
However, I think we're a long way off from watching an all-electric NASCAR race. But that brings us to the end of today's show. Thanks for making AutoLine a part of your day. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, solutions for your journey. Intrepid Control Systems, over-the-air engineering boost your game. MEDC, where Michigan businesses are powering the future of mobility. And by Tajan Automotive Technologies, the formula for better mobility. Intrepid's NeoVi Pi, allowing automotive engineers to interface, capture, and monitor vehicle data using Raspberry Pi. As a matter of fact, it's the automotive industry's first robust platform for Raspberry Pi, featuring Intrepid CanFD technology and Raspberry Pi Compute Module. The NeoVi Pi is designed for automotive environments, allowing use with relative power ranges and applications. In addition, the NeoVi Pi enables you to use the Raspberry Pi for compute while avoiding additional development to adapt to network environments. That makes the NeoVi Pi powerful enough to solve your vehicle network problems, yet small enough to fit in your backpack. One of many intrepid tools used for developing zonal architecture and software defined vehicles. Keeping your heart racing in and out of the gym. That's what really matters. Bridgestone Potenza Sport AS tires with a 50,000 mile limited warranty. Michigan is leading the charge in mobility and innovation and I can't think of a better state to be in.